Hello again, everybody. I am Justin Grainert, Vice President of Public Affairs for the uh, Chattanooga Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I am pleased to have Senator Bill Haggerty with us today. Uh, Senator Haggerty uh, was, was elected to the United States Senate in November of 2020. Uh, he is not a stranger to the state, um, having built a business here, um, as well as serving in the Haslam administration in state government, and uh, most recently was the ambassador to, to Japan uh, in the Trump administration. Uh, he is currently a member of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, he's on the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, and the uh, Committee on Rules and Administration of the Senate. Senator, welcome. Justin, it's great to be with you and back with my friends from Chattanooga today. And as you say, uh, no, no stranger to the area. It was one of the uh, greatest experiences of my life to serve as the uh, Secretary of Economic and Community Development there in Tennessee at a time when we were working our way out of the last recession. Uh, you know, Tennessee's unemployment was higher than the national average. Uh, when we came into office, our you know, economic numbers were, were not where we wanted them to be at all. And uh, to be part of that great turnaround, to see Tennessee's economy now performing at such high levels, uh, it was a great honor and, and, and a great, set of experiences to have and bring with me to the United States Senate. So as the newest member of the Southeast Tennessee delegation, what's your first impression uh, of your, your short time in Washington so far? My first impression is thank God we're from Tennessee, Justin. Uh, you know, Tennessee has got so many positive things happening, setting the pandemic aside. Uh, you know, we've, we've got uh, a terrific state. We've got a very business friendly climate. Uh, you think about the fact that we're a right to work state. We are a very low tax state, no individual tax. From a regulatory standpoint, businesses find it easy to, to survive and thrive. And that result of that has been that our economy has flourished. Uh, and again, go back to my days as economic development chief. We really worked hard to put in place the, uh, the environment so that that would happen. Uh, I recruited like crazy. Uh, when, when I was in my job and for four years, we turned things around. And as I said, when I took that job on, Tennessee was in the bottom half of all the economic metrics. And by the time I left four years later, Tennessee had become the number one state in the nation for economic development, two of those four years. And we had become the number one state in America for jobs created through foreign direct investment. And that again, sort of played into my experience as US ambassador to Japan because the vast majority of that foreign investment that we attracted during my time in the, uh, in the economic development seat was from Japan, 60% of it, so more than all the other nations combined. It helped that, uh, that I worked, lived and worked at one point uh, in Japan from 88 to 91. My uh, former firm, the Boston Consulting Group, sent me there. Um, that's how I learned the language. That's how I learned the economy. It was a very different time. But uh, that was a real advantage for us in terms of recruiting more investment, creating more jobs in Tennessee and creating greater economic prosperity. So uh, with some of those backgrounds, you've, you've kind of laid out um, some of that background, but tell us a little bit more about yourself, kind of how you got to the United States Senate and how you think those experiences will propel your career in the Senate. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a small town kid from Middle Tennessee, Sumner County, um, you know, where Gallatin is. We had a small, small farm in a place called Castalian Springs. Uh, I was the president of my FFA chapter. I grew up raising cattle and pigs. I uh, worked my way through school shoveling asphalt on the road crew, same as my father, same as my grandfather. And I was the first young man in my family to graduate college. So I really, you know, wound up having a career that I couldn't have imagined as a, as a kid from a small town. I wound up working on five different continents. As I mentioned, I lived in Tokyo, Japan for three years. But that sort of experience gave me uh, an opportunity to, to really live the American dream. And I appreciate that. Uh, I wanna see that for all Americans. I think that a good job solves so many other sort of social problems that we may encounter. And bringing that type of economic background, that type of experience and understanding and insight to the United States Senate, I think is absolutely critical given the challenges that we face today. Look, our economy has been devastated by this pandemic. We've got challenges here domestically, we've got challenges internationally. And the fact that I've had that sort of broad-based working experience, I understand how the economy works, and the fact that I served during the Trump administration as the United States ambassador to Japan, which is the third largest economy in the world after the US and China, 
Um, I think that sort of diplomatic and, and national security experience as well has given me just a terrific background, a terrific foundation to come in and serve the people of Tennessee. Well, it does look like your uh, your committee assignments certainly uh, do represent your background well. Um, one of the things that I know that you've had a lot to say on, and I think it's important to kind of get into a little bit, especially with your role in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, is the U.S.-China relationship. Mm, sure. Talk to us about that, because it is critically important on one hand. However, it's obviously a point of contention on another. Talk to us a little bit about that, some of the background and, and sort of where do you see that relationship going and what does the United States need to do to protect itself? Well, Justin, first I'd say this. I mentioned that China is the second largest economy in the world. It is far too large a mar market to ignore, uh, but it is far too critical uh, an entity to, to, to let them continue to behave as they have. We've got to learn how to stand up to China how to get them to behave like a market economy the way we do, to play it according to the rules the way we do. And when they don't, we need to call them out. I've dealt with China. I've lived in the region. Uh, one of the key regions I was stationed in Japan um, is the fact that we've got more US military there than any place else in the world. Why? Because we're dealing with North Korea, Russia, and China every day. China is aggressive from a military standpoint. They're aggressive from a diplomatic standpoint. They're very aggressive from an economic standpoint. I think most of your members understand that. Uh, when it comes to intellectual property theft, we got to stand up against that. When it comes to the fact that they deeply subsidize their champion industries and use that to unfairly compete against ours, we've got to stand up against that. Uh, we've got to make certain that they make their markets open to our products the way we have made our markets open to theirs. It's that type of posture, strength, that uh, China understands. That's why I've advocated to keep a very strong military posture in the region. I support the the quad work that we're doing with Japan, with India, with Australia, to continue to ensure that we've got freedom of navigation of air travel and commerce uh, along the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the one of the busiest, you know, the busiest uh, commerce routes in the world. Uh, this is critically important. And we've got to maintain a constructive relationship with China, but one that holds them in check. And I will be the first to say that we need to make certain that we hold China accountable for this pandemic. Regardless of how the, the, the virus escaped, we know that they took steps to cover it up. We know that they destroyed samples. We know that they silenced researchers. We even know that they forbade internal travel from Wuhan to Beijing. You couldn't get a flight. Yet they allowed flights to fly from Wuhan to Italy. They allowed flights to fly to North America. Uh, they are responsible for the worldwide spread of this pandemic. And when they come around and try to use vaccine diplomacy to act as though they're the savior, uh, I think that's something we got to stand up against very strongly. Obviously, trade is a big piece of this, and, and it's bigger than just China. What are your views on trade in general, and, and how can we be um, as competitive a, as possible in terms of getting our products to the world? Well, first and foremost, we need to have a very competitive domestic local market. When we put in place the Tax Reform Act of 2017, we took America's corporate tax rate from the least competitive in the world at 35 percent down to one that is fairly competitive at 21 we need to retain that sort of competitive posture. We need to make American companies competitive and we need to make the American market the most attractive in the world to invest in. I appreciate that very deeply. When it comes to trade, no one worked harder than I did uh, on the US-Japan trade deal. Uh, as Bob Lighthizer, our trade rep at the time said, he felt it was the best deal that he cut, uh, that we cut as a nation um, dur during the, the previous uh, administration. I worked very hard to make certain that all of the uh, dynamics were in place to get that deal done, to continue to advance the ball for America and see that we opened up Japan's markets, again, the number three largest economy in the world, to particularly America's agricultural exports. It's also a huge uh, deal in terms of our digital trade between the nations. So I think that uh, America's interests are advanced when we have free, fair, and reciprocal trade arrangements with our partners. You see a lot of consternation coming from Europe right now. They don't want to come to the table on a trade deal, but it's because so many of the uh, concessions that they won post-World War II, again, this was designed to help rebuild their economies, um, those conditions should have been time-limited. They were not. As a result, you've got anomalies. Uh, you, you take the automotive sector, which is very strong in Tennessee. Why is it that when we sell a car to Europe, there's a 10% tariff, yet when they sell one to us, it's 2.5%. That's imbalanced. That's not fair. That's not reciprocal. 
these are the types of things I'd like to see improved. And, and I think that America will gain, I think the world will gain as we find reciprocity with our trading partners. That's awesome. I think that's very important as well, especially with the amount of automotive that we have. One of the things that we we obviously have seen, and I know that you've probably heard, uh, you know, the, the pandemic obviously exacerbated a lot of problems that were kind of already there, just sort of sped them up. And, and one of the things that I think we've seen a lot of issues with is our supply chains, yeah. obviously. Um, what can the federal government do, in your estimation, to protect our supply chains, both at home and abroad, to make sure that we our manufacturing uh, sector can do what they need to do to get products out to, to I think one of the most important federal level protections that we can do is make certain that we have clean communication channels. That means not allowing providers like Huawei into our system where we can expose and make vulnerable American corporation secrets, American corporations data, uh, things that would allow uh, the continued theft of intellectual property that we know has occurred with China and with other nations. So from a federal standpoint, I think that's something that we need to continue to push. The United States government stepped up, blocked Huawei and its ilk from, from becoming part of our next generation 5G network. I worked very hard when I was U.S. ambassador to Japan to get Japan to do the same thing. They did. New Zealand, Australia have followed suit. I'm optimistic the U.K. will soon. We need to work hard to get all of our allies to make certain that we have clean networks to operate across. Because if you think about how supply chains are managed, it's managed across these large networks. When it comes to the environment in which uh, our companies operate, where they source product, uh, I think American companies have woken up, and this, this, this happened well before the pandemic. Uh, again, when I served as ambassador to Japan, very often American CEOs would come and visit me as they toured Asia. And they were very concerned about their exposure to communist China. And I would say on, on the whole, American CEOs, American boards were not approving new investment in China unless it was for the domestic market. Uh, they were doing everything they could at that point to move supply chains out, to move any excess capacity that was available in the system outside of China. They were looking to fill that capacity in other places. I think that trend will continue. Uh, what's been underscored by the pandemic is the fact that just-in-time manufacturing, as it does drive efficiency, also exposes vulnerabilities. And I think what we'll see is a trend toward reshoring. I'm going to work as hard as I can to get as many jobs back to America as I possibly can. But to the extent that those jobs aren't coming back to America, I think you're going to see them nearshored, meaning looking to our partners in uh, Central America uh, and in Mexico. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of talk right now about root causes of the immigration problem. I can tell you the root cause, the immediate problem is the Biden administration, the message that they're sending by collapsing our border and encouraging uh, the sort of uh, mayhem that we see right now. But longer term, in the middle to, to, to long range, I think that we have great opportunity to, as we reshore these jobs from China, if they're not coming to America, to help uh, put them into a place in this hemisphere uh, with our allies uh, you know, here, here in our own neighborhood. That's, again, uh, in that same vein, computer chips, battery technology. As we continue to advance technology in cars, computers, all of that. Obviously, computer chips and battery technology is going to be critical, especially for our region uh, in the state of Tennessee with as much automotive as we had. What can be done at the federal level to either support better supply chains for those two entities, or how can we better incentivize computer chip technology and battery technology to, to, to be made here in America? Well, the, the absolute best thing we can do to encourage made in America is to create the best possible environment to invest capital in America. That means low taxes, that means business-friendly regulations, get rid of the sclerosis, get rid of the duplicity in the regulations, make permitting easier. Those are the types of things that I want to see done. Uh, the Endless Frontiers Act that just passed has $52 billion in it to support chip manufacturing. But, but rather than have subsidies, rather than have that type of environment, what I want to see is to create the, the most favorable environment for capital investment ever. You've got it happening here right now. You just I was there for the announcement with LG from South Korea and GM putting a major battery facility in the middle Tennessee. SK just south of uh, Chattanooga there in North Georgia, another major investment in batteries. We're going to continue to see the automotive industry thrive in America. We're going to see it continue to thrive in Tennessee. But in the long run, the very best way to make certain that that happens is to have policies that are supportive of the economy, that are supportive of capital investment. That will drive our success, and that's where I'm focusing my attention. That's, again, another great 
way to continue to grow the economy in, in our part of the world, especially um, within the United States and, and globally. Ransomware has become uh, quite a problem, um, especially with larger corporations and entire sectors of the economy. What do you see can be done um, to prevent hackers from holding businesses digitally hostage? And um, how do we protect businesses and industries that are important to our economy to keep prices spiking, keeping prices from spiking? Well, as a nation, we need to be clear that no industry and no company that's hacked is acceptable. Rather than submit a list of 16 industries that need to be uh, not touched, as just happened uh, between President Biden and President Putin, we should say no industry in America should be touched. This should be a zero tolerance uh, environment, and we should not encourage, support, or approve of the payment of ransom, which is exactly what this administration is doing right now. I'm against it, um, and I think that we need to stand strong. We need to help strengthen our networks, and we need to stand up and use all the resources that are, are at our disposal to push back whenever this occurs. So you've got a couple of busy weeks. If you've read the newspapers, for, for those of us that, that are following along, obviously there's a lot of things on your plate uh, heading into the August recess. We have infrastructure. Uh, you recently held a roundtable in Chattanooga to discuss infrastructure. Um, what did you take from that meeting? Um, and what are your thoughts on the current proposal being floated? How does that look going forward in the next couple of weeks? The um, takeaway from my meeting in Chattanooga there and my meetings across the state are that Tennesseans and Americans, I think, support investment that can generate a positive return on investment. That's hard, tangible, real infrastructure. What's happening here right now, uh, we've got two packages. One is, is called a bipartisan package. That's the product of a negotiation between a small team of Republicans, Democrats in the White House. We've also got something called reconciliation, which uh, President Biden has promised to shove through again on the American people. Uh, as a business person, I find it very hard to accept an environment where somebody says, let's come to the table, let's agree on the things that we can agree upon and everything else that I want in the deal, I'm just gonna shove through anyway. That's not a bipartisan negotiation. Uh, I haven't seen the details of this package. They haven't been drafted yet. Uh, I'm very discouraged by the environment though. So we'll wait and see what happens. Again, Americans and Tennesseans I think approve of investment in real infrastructure, but what's happening, what I'm seeing unfold here right now uh, is something less than a bipartisan approach to that. We do have, you, you mentioned the corporate tax rate earlier, and that's one of the things I think that is gonna be part of the discussion, obviously, the, the Biden administration and Democrats in Congress have, have made no bones about trying to attack the, the tax deal that was struck uh, under the Trump administration. Where do you see that conversation going? Obviously, there's going to be a spike in federal spending, um, as we've seen with the reconciliation bill, and then talk of a anywhere from a three trillion to six trillion dollar package, depending on which segment of the Democratic Party gets their way in the Senate. Um, where do you see taxes going from here, and and how do you see the business community needing to react to sort of the uncertainty that's now sort of back in the system? What I can say is that coming out of a pandemic, coming out of a recession, the last thing you should do is increase taxes, yet that's exactly what the um, Democrats in Congress are proposing. And they're proposing to do it in a way that actually will make America less competitive. If they want to tax capital, if they want to tax uh, corporate uh, earnings, they're going to make America less competitive on the global horizon. Uh, I think that's exactly the wrong turn to take, uh, particularly right now as we're, we're recovering from a recession. The level of spending that, 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 that we've incurred, again, what happened last year before I was in the Senate, I think was done on a bipartisan basis because the members of the Senate, the members of the House realized that we needed to get through a pandemic, an unprecedented pandemic. But what I saw happen here in March of this year was a completely partisan $1.9 trillion package that was shoved through without a single Republican vote at a time when we're already seeing inflation take off. What we're seeing happen today is an unprecedented level of inflation. That's got me concerned. I think we're looking back to the Jimmy Carter years right now. And what we hear coming from the Democrats is a desire to shove through, as you said, numbers in the trillions of dollars. Much of this having nothing to do with what you or I or the people on this, uh, this podcast would think of as traditional infrastructure. We've got to put a halt to this. I'm going to stand up against it. All right, we got one final question. Um, what is one book that you would recommend to our audience that they add to their bookshelves? And it can be more than one if you have several. But uh, You know, I'm going to share with you um, one that, that's, that's not a popular title, 
but it's one that I would encourage uh, the, the, the business community of Tennessee to look up. It's called Henderson on Corporate Strategy, written by a man named Bruce Henderson, graduate of Vanderbilt from Walter Hill, Tennessee, near Murfreesboro. Bruce Henderson founded the firm that I started my career in called the Boston Consulting Group, BCG. Uh, I was just over about, I don't know, four or five weeks ago in Israel meeting with Bibi Netanyahu. We spent an hour and a half together. Bibi started his career at the Boston Consulting Group too. We both spent our time talking about how Bruce Henderson's philosophy had affected our view of business. Bibi talked about how when he was finance secretary of Israel, how Bruce's philosophy had helped him think about how to grow the economy there. I shared with him about how Bruce's philosophy on competitiveness helped me think about Tennessee's economy too. So I would encourage people to look up uh, Bruce Henderson, Henderson on corporate strategy, again, from a Tennessean who founded one of the preeminent strategy consulting firms in the world. Uh, that would be my recommendation. Fantastic. Well, Senator, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your service to our state. We look forward to having you in person in Chattanooga sometime soon. So we'll we'll have Stan settles on uh, speed sure. dial to make sure we can get that to happen. And uh, again, we appreciate your time today and look forward to having you back here in the future. Great. Thanks very much. Great to be with you. Thanks, Senator.